I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. This series of podcasts is aimed at financial planning professionals and also those who are looking to enter the financial planning profession. We will be talking during the podcast about all things Certified Financial Planner certification related, talking to other CFPs around the world, And also, we will be dropping in on some new entrants who've just entered the financial planning profession, and we'll be checking up along the way on a regular basis with them to see how they're getting on. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And today we are talking everything to do with gaining your Certified Financial Planner Assessment and the CISI Level 7 Assessment. And I'm joined by a very special guest, a lady who has passed her CFP on her very first submission. And we are going to talk about her journey and how she got there and all the ups and downs in between in a minute. But before we start, I'd just like to welcome Hetty Hyde Durant, from who's a financial planner from Broadway Financial Planning. Hello, Hetty. Hello, Jackie. Thank you for joining me today. We have lots to talk about, don't we? And I'm going to congratulate you so many times before the end of this interview, no doubt. <laughs> but you are, uh, you have done amazingly well, worked so hard to gain your CFP license and pass your CISI Level 7 case study on your very first submission. So many congratulations. Thank you very much. I was quite surprised. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to get into the detail of all of that in a minute. But at the very start, let's just look at, tell us a little bit about how you got into the financial planning profession. Okay, so I think it might be best to start where I kind of started my career. Um, So I did economics at university. And after that, went into a finance graduate scheme, um, which essentially put you down the accountancy route. And I realized quite quickly that that isn't what I wanted to do. So I did a job for about 10 months um, and thought, this isn't it. This isn't the one for me. Um, And so without actually knowing what I wanted to do, I applied to do a master's to kind of give myself some more time. (laughs) Um, And then once I completed that at Bristol University, I, I applied for a job as a funds analyst, which was in an investment operations team. So that was more fund compliance and daily fund pricing and fund dealing and although I had a really great team and I was working with great people it was still I was still missing something um so within the organization I moved to investment proposition which I then started to work with financial advisors and that's where the kind of the entry point for me started and my little brain started to tick away thinking, oh, I think I could do this. <laughs> this is something I would enjoy more. Um, so my role there was speaking to advisors, getting their feedback on the proposition and then working on how to improve that pro- proposition. Um, and it made me think, actually, that's something I would really like to do. So I began my exams from that point um, and everything escalated from there, really. Fantastic. And then did you go straight from there to Broadway? Um, I did, yes. So what I did was I essentially emailed um, four, five, six different advice and planning firms um, with the line of, I'm thinking about becoming an advisor. Can I come and speak to you for some advice of how to do that, essentially? And um, that was, if I was speaking to anybody who's thinking about going into the profession, I would always say do that exercise because I didn't really understand the difference between advisors and planners and wealth managers and how they all have slightly different roles. So at the time, I just thought there was advisors, basically. And speaking to different firms, and especially Kerry at Broadway Financial Planning, she kind of opened my eyes to financial planning being slightly different Um, and when I was speaking to different firms I would ask them what their you know culture was what their values were um, how they like to work with their clients if they work in office hours if every all the meetings happen at the office or at clients homes so there was a few things that after I'd met with different firms I realized oh that's important to me that's how I would like to work and that isn't how I would like to work Um, and one of those things that signaled to me in a really tangible way of how of a firm's culture and values is actually how advisors were remunerated because I realized that showed me where the firm wanted 
the advisors to put their energy and put their emphasis. And for me, that wasn't on getting lots of new clients. That was on looking after the ones that you've got. And obviously, some firms can get that balance absolutely perfect. But I didn't. I knew what I didn't want was a firm that had a lot of pressure on getting lots of new clients in. Yes. Um, chasing that target. Chasing that target, exactly. Um, that's not how I like to work. And it wasn't the culture that I wanted to work in. So that's definitely something I would recommend people do if they're starting out. And essentially, I came and met with Kerry. And after speaking to her, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. This is the exact type of firm I want to work in. And I was just a bit cheeky. And I said, this sounds perfect. Have you got any opportunities? (laughs) And she said, let me go away and think about it and came back and said, yes, we have. Um, So then I went through a formal interview process. um, And that's how I ended up where I am. So after a little trip traveling in between the two jobs I started here excellent wow and so w- how long ago was that so what your what's your journey been like since then and how did you come across the certified financial planner hmm. so I joined in 18 months ago um, so October 22 and I joined straight as a trainee financial planner and um, one of the firms that I spoke to before I joined um, said that when planners join them, they go through the whole, they go through every role essentially. So they are joiners and administrators to the financial planners, then a para planner and then a planner. And I thought for some people that's an ideal route. But for me, I knew that that wasn't right. And luckily Kerry supported the approach that I wanted to take, which was go into the role that you know you're, you know, want to do in the end and yes. learn how to do that one really well. Yeah. So um, that's what I did. And Kerry is a certified financial planner. So, um, and Broadway Financial Planning is an accredited firm. So it just kind of fit that CFP was the next step for me. Um, and I didn't want to get out of the cycle of doing exams. So it might seem a little bit early in my career, perhaps, to be doing CFP. But I, I thought perhaps if I stopped doing exams, starting again would become quite difficult. <laughs> yes. I think life takes over us at a point, doesn't it? And uh, but now you you know you've had all that time carved out for doing all your study and revision, mm. so it's a natural step on to try and finish off perhaps with the CFP. Although that might not be the end of the story, you never know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that was another thing as well because originally I just kind of default started on the chartered CII route, um, and when Kerry spoke to me about CFP, I thought, oh well, the CFP will also means I don't have to do AF5 in the CII route and I'm here planning the best way to get certified with the CISI and chartered with the CII and it, I thought maybe that that was a bit ambitious for the short amount of time I was here but <laughs> one for the well, future I think. Absolutely and it- a a huge achievement to pass on your first submission anyway, but to pass having only joined the financial planning profession essentially, you know, just 18 months ago um, is testament actually to all of your hard work. But like you said, you know, right at the start of this interview, you know, the culture that is at Broadway and the support that you've had as well um, to be able to see you through to gain, um, to become a certified financial planner in such a short space of time. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I know anybody who has done it in such a short space of time, Hetty. So um, very well done for all of that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so let's get into some of the nitty gritty, because I know that some of our listeners who are either partway through their level seven case study en route to becoming a CFP, or we've got quite a few people who are interested in doing it, but actually haven't started the process yet. So when you realised that you wanted to do the CFP and you thought, right, OK, let's roll my sleeves up and get on with it. Did you do the level six? I'm guessing you did the level six exam first? Yes, I did that one first. OK. And how did you find that? What Did you have a particular approach to studying for that? I found that one OK. Again, I didn't think I would have passed and then I did. So perhaps I underestimate myself sometimes. <laughs> um, but I ended up passing with distinction. So again, very proud of myself but it was a tricky exam especially the middle section where you had to write an essay and I think that's just because of lack of experience of writing essays you know being out of university for nearly 10 years at that point um but no it was okay I think if you've done your level four it's just putting all the pieces of the jigsaw together as opposed to really learning anything new is what I found yeah so kind of really just applying the knowledge that you've got isn't it rather than learning lots of new stuff Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
So then moving swiftly on to the level seven, did you have a break between getting your level six exam and sit and taking the level seven case study and getting cracking with that? Or just no, went just straight in? Jump straight in. <laughs> straight in, both feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of a theme going on here, there isn't is. there? <laughs> um, so you get your case study. Tell us about your approach. So first of all, I read through it several times um but I guess one step before that I applied to go on your course um which I would encourage anybody to do because I think without that I wouldn't have known how to even go about approaching the case study really um so the course really just gave me some structure to work towards and some timelines to work towards yeah. I say that I didn't stick to the timelines I had them there and it just holds you a little bit accountable so even if you've not stuck to it at least you've got that nagging thing in your head saying I'm a week behind you need to put in the hours yeah so I would read I read through it a few times and I ended up having you know flip charts stuck to my living room wall my partner was probably it was probably driving him crazy with <laughs> sticky notes <laughs> everywhere and you know family tree of my case study up on the wall and things like that and um, but that was a really good reminder that Hetty you need to be working you need to get your head down you know over the, it was only t- I say only 10 weeks it goes so quickly it does yeah that there's not a lot of time to waste um and there's a few techniques I kind of picked up so have you ever heard of the Pomodoro technique I haven't Ah, So it's like a studying technique where you study for 25 minutes and then you have a five minute break and you do that cycle four times. And once you've done that four times, you then have a 20 minute break. And so I think by then you've been working for, you know, two and a half hours, but you've for the most part had your head down. And in that five minute break, you're meant to, you know, get up, move your move your legs, have a cup of tea. But in that 25 minutes, you are head down, concentrating, no distractions. And that really helped me because it kind of keeps you on track and stops some of that procrastination that can quite easily happen. Yes, there are lots of rabbit holes to disappear down during the level seven case study, isn't there? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You can easily distract yourself for quite a long time going, hmm, a little pondering on that one. And then the day's gone. Exactly. So it's even distracting yourselves on things relevant for the case study, but then actually it's not going to help you get any better yeah. It's not going to help you progress your case study. It's just more knowledge that you didn't actually need for the thing you're trying to achieve. So, yes. um, yeah, but it was it was it was tricky, the 10 weeks. And I think having I worked out if it's 200 hours, that's what about five full time working weeks that you have to yes. fit into 10 weeks whilst full time working. Yep. Um, so I was lucky that I had um, support from um, my company in study days and things. Yes. But essentially every weekend was blocked out to do it. And so were there particular areas of the case study that you just thought, oh, I don't like the look of this one or, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, how how did you approach those bits? So my case study was really estate planning heavy. And I think when we had our first few chats, I was like, is this, is this all? Because it was when we were doing the retirement planning section. And I was thinking, yep. I feel like it should be harder than this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of the hard bits was the Excel parts and, you know, testing that knowledge. But the actual planning part, it wasn't that difficult up to that point for, for my particular case study. But then when it got onto protection and more so estate planning, which is the area that I just na- um, so far in my career had had less experience with, it really I really felt like I was thrown in at the deep end um, and had to do a lot of learning really quickly mm-hmm. on that section. So that was the part I found most challenging. Um, yeah. But it was useful because it meant I spoke to other advisors for their input and I spoke to some solicitors and said, can I do this? Is this allowed? You know, I just my knowledge expanded so much by being challenged in that estate planning section. Yes, I think sometimes, you know, every case study is different, as we've talked about during our time together, haven't we? Mm. That you you know, overall, it's a level seven, but because of the natural nuances with different case study scenarios uh, and the different people involved, you end up with it being kind of loaded in one direction. Um, And obviously yours was lulling you into a false sense of security (laughs) before uh, giving that door a good slam in your face. (laughs) Exactly. I remember you saying to me, and probably only had two weeks ago, you know, Hetty, you are going to need about 15 pages for estate planning. And I was like, oh my days. (laughs) So, um, and I did need that many pages, so I had to go back and cut a lot of the previous sections down. Um, wow. And that estate 
planning section was the longest part. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you overcame all of that. And I think that's, you know, taking on new knowledge. Normally, the CFP is an application of the knowledge that you have. So mm. taking on that new knowledge can, you know, it, it can be obviously quite stressful at the time, um, mm. you know, give you a massive boost in confidence to know that you're going about it the right way. Um, but it, if you have to do that, and you imagine if you had to do that in too many sections other than the estate planning section, you know, you could quite easily run yourself out of time, couldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I... I know I passed, but I did run out of time. So I um, I haven't told you this, but I was finishing my inheritance tax calculations at 20 to 4 and the submission was 4 (laughs) o'clock. So this is not advice for other people to follow. (laughs) This is Um, how not to do it. (laughs) This is how not to do it. But the plan that you put together, you know, aims that you finish it at least a week before. You have time to put it in the drawer for a couple of days or longer if possible. Go back and read it. Perhaps get somebody who isn't in the profession to read it. I didn't really have any any time. I didn't have time for any of those things. Wow. Um, or I did have time, but I did used it incorrectly. I, <laughs> you know, so those last couple of weeks, I was thinking, I'm not going to get this done. There's no chance. But I just spent so many hours, really, really crammed in those last few weeks. So it is possible if you get to that point, it is possible to just just keep going, get as much yes. done as you can. And my theory was, if I just get as much down on paper as I can the feedback will tell me where I've gone wrong. Yes. Um, and that and was the approach. And then I actually ended up getting to the end and I was like, oh, oh my days, I've done it, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. So um, not the approach to take, but... You did it's it. Just, I did it. It's just getting those hours in, I think. Yes. And do you have a feel for how many hours overall it took you? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I really <laughs> lost hard, track. It? Yeah. It's really hard. So at the beginning, I tracked it and I actually planned out okay if you work for two hours on that day and eight hours on that day and three hours on that day and I thought this is never going to get up to 200 which I know is what the the CIS I say will take um but I think in the end I probably did get there just because of that last couple of weeks of the last two weeks it of was cramming yeah, yeah. <laughs> no eating no sleeping no talking to anybody else and definitely Honestly. no socializing <laughs> <laughs> my um my boyfriend was incredible because he just took over everything you know we split everything fairly equally anyway but he just did 100% of everything in the house for those last few weeks so yeah there it's nice to have that support around you You definitely need it during um that time whether that be through friends or family um because it is a rough ride (laughs) yeah having that support around you it's not you know you think you're doing it or you decide to embark on it but it's, it has much wider impact on everybody around you than I think most people realise initially, don't they? Oh, absolutely. I remember my friend sent me something um, and I just said, I don't have the capacity to, you know, it was something a little bit sad. And I was like, I don't have the capacity for that. She's like, oh, sorry, I forgot you're in the case study. <laughs> you're deep in the case study. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, well. yeah, and she was like, I'm sorry, we'll talk about it later. So, um, you know, they do, your friends really do support you and understand that, yeah, yeah, that it's not absolutely. an easy task. Yeah. And so you, I know that you were just saying oh, before we came on air that you had the whole of March blocked out for uh, submission two, mm-hmm. <laughs> which yeah. obviously not needed at all. So what are you going to do needed. with all that time now? <laughs> well, I'm actually really pleased because I'm getting married in at the start of May and the resubmission date, I think, was the second or third of May yeah. for the, the next one. And I'm getting married on the 5th. So I was like, wow, that's going to be a really busy few months if I'm trying to resubmit and plan and the wedding wow. um so to be honest I think I'm just gonna enjoy the free time see yes. friends socialize and not have to worry <laughs> well yes and deservedly so absolutely go make it up to all the people that you've gone oh I haven't got the headspace to talk to you today so. yeah <laughs> exactly exactly so if you let's talk about you know uh, there are plenty of people out there who are thinking about doing the CFP and embarking on that process um do you think that for you as a person, as a financial planner, it's changed or will change the way that you look at clients, the way that perhaps you think through the questions you ask them or the way that you create a financial plan? Yeah, so I think the really, um, I guess the quick, easy answer to that was 
the work on assumptions that we did and I know you're a big fan of assumptions Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but I now feel so much more confident speaking to clients about why we use different assumptions and being able to say to them actually I've looked at this really recently I've looked at 30 years of data I'm happy to explain why this why we do it this way Um, and having that confidence that you know you've done that work yourself rather than it just being oh we use three percent for inflation because we do Um, well, now I know why we do and I know why I'm happy with that assumption. And that's really, um, it's just given me quite a lot of confidence in that area. And I actually came back to Kerry and the um, the other guys in their team and said, can we please just agree a house view on uh, growth rate assumptions for different asset classes and different risk approaches and different funds. And we've now got one standardized document between us that I think that's one of the changes that's happened within the firm. And before it was happening, but just informally. And now we've just made it a little bit more formal. Um, So that's kind of the key one, I would say. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. That's good to hear. I think that's the main thing for me. I'm sure there's many others, but (laughs) that's the one that's tangible. And I think, you know, it might be that, you know, as you see clients now and, you know, you have more in-depth conversations that, you know, other people have said that actually helps them with the conversations, um, you know, broader than assumptions, um, because you can look at figures and perhaps see things coming towards them, potential issues down the track um, Mm. a little bit further away than perhaps you did before. Um, So it enables you to have, you know, flag up those kinds of conversations, even if it's things that they have to go away and think about, you know, they can't just answer on the spot, but it it kind of helps you give them that little bit of extra breathing space, if you like. Yeah, that's that's made me think of something else, actually, which um, was that in my case study, it had said, Ma, you're, um, I really hate paying inheritance tax was the phrase or something similar. Yeah. Well, if a client said to me, I'd like to do inheritance tax planning, it's made me realise actually there's a couple of things there. Is it you want, do not want to pay the tax or is it that um, you just don't want the tax to come out of your estate? Because then there's different ways of, of doing it. Is it let's minimise the amount you pay or we can pay for it using a life insurance policy? And so it's made me realise that objectives aren't black and white. You have to dig into them. You have to understand what's motivating the client to say what they're saying um and that's something that I think I've taken away um especially with the case study all you had was what they had written down so you had to take it as it was or you had to make some assumptions but in real life you can go back and ask the client and so I think I do that more now rather than taking you know the first throwaway comment they might say which is oh I hate inheritance tax okay well why is it that you don't you know and we'll go through it in more detail and that's something as well that I think I think I've learned to do better. Yes. And that's really interesting, isn't it? How it just makes you look, at, you know, what they say very slightly differently to, you know, like you say, to dig a little bit deeper, to get a bit more clarification so you can truly build a, a financial plan that reflects, you know, the client's wishes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, we're nearly out of time, actually, although, Hetty, I could talk to you all afternoon. Um, so, just thinking about giving advice to those people who are sat on the fence who might be listening to the podcast and thinking yes I know Jackie keeps bullying me trying to get me to do the CFP sometime in 2024 um do you have any advice to people who are thinking about embarking on that journey Mm, okay so um the first thing I would say is do it on a course I, I cannot comprehend how you would end how you can pass this without a structured approach um, or a course. Like, obviously, I went on your tracky, but I know that there are others out there um, because the information that the CIS I give you and the um, example plan, I don't. I think it wouldn't pass it, itself if that was submitted. So it's not really an ideal example plan. You can't use it as a template. Um, I don't know. Would Would you agree with that, Jackie? Yeah, I think the plan yeah. probably would just about pass, but okay. probably by the skin of its teeth. But I think, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not an ideal, is it? It's not ideal. And I think it's going, forcing you to go through a, a different thought process if you were looking at the plan and trying to copy that rather mm. than going on a course forces you to think things through yourself, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. And I, at the start, I was really struggling with not having something to kind of refer to. And actually, I think it was your advice or, um, Somebody else I spoke to, Keith Button, I think, had said, 
try not to go through the case study that the example plan you've been given in detail because you need to create your own plan and that's really important that they're separate and it's really hard to read a phrase that says your objective is you know to pay less inheritance tax and then not just copy that word for word you have to come up with your own wording and it's so important it gets drilled, it gets drilled into you that nothing can be copied and obviously I wouldn't copy but it's hard to read one sentence and try and replicate it without copying yes, without yes <laughs> so, absolutely um, so yeah I would say go on a course because the other thing is if you don't pass first time you obviously have to resubmit and the cost is the same every time you do it it's not a lower cost to resubmit so over the long term I think you'd end up paying more not going on a course yeah yeah absolutely um, and then once you've decided that I would say start early um I think some of my feedback to you of the course Jackie was actually I think you give people a week to do some of the prep work but I think people could start prepping even earlier than that and I think things like the assumptions you could start writing even before you've got your case study because a lot of them will be the same and actually there's only a few that are different between case studies I think um so I think there's things you can start doing and start building a plan of what each week's going to look like um so something I did was I created headings for each section of the plan so as I was working through and I was thinking, oh, I know I'm in the protection section, but actually I really have just had this thought about estate planning or retirement planning. You can put it in to the case study as like a draft. And then as you work through it, you're like, okay, yeah, I've ticked that off. I've ticked that off. Um, rather than all these ideas floating around in your head, just get them down on paper in one place. Yeah. So get that you can focus somewhere. on, the, get them out somewhere and mm -hmm. focus on the section you're on and do it a bit more methodically. So that was something that really helped. And I think that probably helps you sleep a little bit better at, the, uh, at night as well, doesn't it? Because you're not trying to hold it all in your head. Um, although, tell me, were you fed up of these clients by the time you get to the end of the case study? Oh, I was really fed up. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, when I found out I passed, I went back and reread my case study. And I was like, wow, I've really blocked out a lot of this. <laughs> Maybe it was, you know, blocking out the pain. Um, but yeah, you, you do get quite fed up by the end. You feel like you really know them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Tear up that case study, throw it in the bin. Yeah. <laughs> now you've passed. Onwards yeah. and upwards. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Hetty, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm sure that uh, all of our listeners are going to be really pleased to have heard all about your journey to become a certified financial planner. And thanks again for joining me today. That's OK. Thank you for having me. It's really interesting, isn't it, to listen to different people who have different experiences of gaining their certified financial planner certification or maybe developing the financial planning profession at large. If you know anybody who you think might be interested in listening to any of these podcasts, then please do pass on our details. That's it for me. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. See you again soon. Bye for now.